conflict in Albuquerque and in New Mexico. And God recognizes the reality of conflict. God wants us to heal our relationships. He wants us to heal the conflict. We have conflict today of all areas in America. I mean, you have racial conflict. You have political conflict. I mean, Democrats and Republicans and the Green Party and the No Party and oh my gosh, and labor and management conflicts and uh, Hispanics against Anglos and Muslims against Jews and Koreans against blacks. And oh my gosh, it's environmentalists against loggers. And it's like, goodness gracious, man, can't we all just get along? But it's not like that. We have gang wars, turf wars, net wars, generational wars, holy wars. We even have star wars. Okay, just want to see if you were listening. Work that in there. <laughs> but all kidding aside, we have all kinds of tension. Tension that's dividing us. You know what? In the last 3,500 years, we've only had 286 years of peace. In 3,500 years, only 286 years were peaceful because we live in a broken, divided, fragmented world that's desperate to learn how to be able to get along. And people need to learn how to reconcile one with the other, to get along with one another, to heal the wounds with one another. The book of Romans chapter 12, verse 17 says, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone will, can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. So Heavenly Father, I pray that you help us to really learn the steps of resolving conflict, God, that we can apply them to our life and help others apply them so that, God, we won't be living in a community of tension, but one of love and, and, and being able to get along even in our differences. And I pray this in Christ's name, amen. amen. You see, when people have conflict, there's a lot of damage of unresolved conflict. And, and the damage of unresolved conflict is, is, first of all, it blocks our fellowship with God. It really blocks our fellowship with God. When you have divided conflict and, and unresolved conflict, it, it, it really separates you from God. You can't have true fellowship with God when you have ought with somebody else. The Bible even says it in 1 John 4, 20. It says, if someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, that person is a liar. But if, he, if we don't love people who we can see, how can we love God whom we can't see? He's saying, in other words, guys, get real. Get real. If you can't even get along with people that, that are here right now, but you say you love God, a God that you can't even see. I know we can see him in people, but he's saying, you need to get real. You really need to get real, and you need to understand that it blocks your relationship with me when you don't get along with one another. Another problem that exists when you don't get along with each other is it prevents our prayers from being answered. It prevents our prayers from being answered. Men specifically, do you know that it's very clear in the Bible that when we don't treat our wife right and we don't get along with them right, our prayers will not be answered. Man, that's scary, guys. And that's not just guys, gals as well. We've got to treat each other with love and kindness. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it says it right there. It says, man, if you don't get along, your prayers will be hindered. So if you want your prayers to be answered, you need to get along with each other. And the third thing it creates is when you don't have fellowship with God and you have unresolved conflict, it hinders our happiness. People just aren't happy. They're miserable, actually. They're going around all mad. They're going along gritting their teeth. They're going along angry. They're going along just frustrated. Because you know what? It's hard to be mad at someone and act like everything's fine. So if you're a greeter, you're up in the front. Hey, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> you're really gr grinding your teeth instead of smiling. It's like, man, it's calmed down. In the book of Job, chapter 18, verse 4, he says, you may tear out your hair in anger, but will that destroy the earth? Will that cause the rocks to tremble? What he's saying is, when you get angry, you're hurting yourself. You're hurting yourself. You can pull your hair out. Haven't you been so mad? I got just pull my hair out. And there's some people that literally start pulling their hair. And it's like, the only one that hurts is you. 
The person you're mad at doesn't get hurt. They're just watching you going, wow, you're weird. You're pulling your hair out. That's got to be horrible. Are you with me? It doesn't make the rocks tremble. Oh, they're pulling their hair out. I wonder what they're going to do to me. It, it, you're hurting yourself. Quit hurting yourself. So God is very clear, and he gives us steps for resolving conflict. And I want to share with you biblical steps for resolving conflict. I'm going to give you seven of them. There's a lot of things that we could do. But the very, very first thing, if we want to resolve conflict, is we've got to take the initiative in resolving conflict. We have to take the first step. We've got to do something about it. You can't just talk about it. You can't just pray about it. You have to do something. Go and take some steps in trying to make it right. It's not going to get right all by itself. When people barely get married or they're barely starting a relationship, everyone's trying to get along. They call it artful dodging. In other words, there's conflict. No, let's not talk about it. Let's, ooh, let's dodge that. Let's avoid that. And you, but before long, you can't avoid it anymore because you know what? If you're in any kind of relationship, romantic or not, you will have conflict. That's just life. You're not always going to agree. But there's a way to disagree that glorifies God. Conflict is seldom resolved accidentally. Not like, how do you guys, oh, time heals everything. No, it doesn't. Time doesn't heal anything. If it healed something, they would just put you in the waiting room at the emergency room. They make you wait for hours as it is. Do you get any better? No. You even get worse. You get worse because now you're all agitated and I can't believe that they're making me, here I am bleeding and blah, 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 and you just, it's a mess. Time doesn't heal anything. It just makes it worse. So if you keep putting it off that you're festering more and more and you, we end up babying that, that, that anger. We, we baby that grudge. We, we nurse the grudge and it becomes something absolutely horrible and then we get in each other's face. So God is saying what I want you to do is I want you to resolve your conflict, but face to face, to really deal with it, to try to do what you can. And if you're going to really take the initiative, there's a few things you need to consider. <coughs> the very first thing you've got to consider if you're going to take the initiative is you better deal with your fear first. Before you go talk to them, deal with your fear. Now, let me tell you what I mean by the fear is when you have to confront somebody Right away, there's a fear that kind of overgrips us and overcomes us because we go, oh, no, I got to go talk to my boss. Oh, I got to talk to my fellow coworkers. Oh, I got to talk to my girlfriend. Oh, I got to talk to my wife. Oh, I got to talk to my husband. I got, whoever it's with, we're, we're kind of stressed about it. Like, oh, I got to talk to them and I'm scared. And if you're scared, congratulations, you're a normal human being. Everyone is scared to a certain degree. They're concerned. They're like, I don't know. Here it goes. And you've got to use wisdom. Look, fear of conflict goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Do you remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden? They were living naked. And no one even, they didn't even think anything of it. But when they sinned, all of a sudden they go, oh, we're naked and we have to hide. And God shows up in Genesis chapter 3. And he goes, hey, Adam, Eve, where are you guys? It wasn't like he didn't know where they were. He was trying to say, what's going on in your lives? What happened? What's going on? Where are you now? Because you're not where you're supposed to be spiritually. And in chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 10, Adam said, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. You see, he saw. He saw what was happening. He saw that he had messed up, and he didn't want to confront it. We seldom don't want to confront when we mess up, amen? It's like, oh, I got to talk to my husband. Oh, he was wrong too, but I was more wrong. And, oh, and then if I say I'm sorry, he's going to throw it in my face. And oh, I don't know. We go through all these gyrations. And when you've been caught and you've been exposed, man, you're vulnerable. And when people get caught and they get exposed of, of, of what they were doing, they get defensive. So now they're all defensive and they're, they're afraid to, to reveal the real self and 
oh, if they find out what I'm really thinking or who I am, they're not even going to like me anymore, and I get all defensive, or, or we get distant. We pull away from people. We pull away because we don't want them to, to know too much about what's going on, and if they pull away, then they can't really come out. Or we become very demanding. Because then if we start bossing people around, we're going to take them in the direction we want to take them, and we're going to have the last word, and we're going to let them talk. You see, fear keeps us from connecting at a deeper level. And it really overwhelms us, and that's why we've got to make sure that, that, that because we have a tendency to fear rejection, we fear being misunderstood, we feel being, we, we're fearful of being used again or hurt. And man, the real question you need to ask yourself is, why am I so afraid to tell them who I am? Why am I so afraid to, to just tell them this is me, this is what I'm about, this is what's going on? In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, God has given us a spirit, of, has not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but a spirit of power, a spirit of love, a spirit of self-discipline. He's saying, I'll be with you. Perfect love casts out all fear. God is love, and I'm going to help you. So you need to ask God, and you need to pray about it, and you need to say, God, I really need to take the initiative, but I need to start dealing by, with my fear. And another thing I need to deal with before I take the initiative is I've got to deal with the right timing. What's the right timing for this? Timing is everything. He calls us to be peacemakers, and he wants us to be peacemakers, but sometimes we just don't get it, and we don't quite handle things right, and we, we handle it, and we botch it all up. You've got to deal with it. Quit putting it off. I mean, look what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. He says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. And he says, go and be reconciled to the person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So he's saying, if you bring a gift, if you bring an offering to the Lord, and he says, no, 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 go get right with them. You're supposed to leave and go get right and then come back and finally present it. So if any of you get up and walk out, I understand you're wrong with somebody, and, but leave your offering here. Leave your offering here. Okay, <laughs> I, okay I'm just joking. But all kidding aside, we, we've got to lay it down and, and, and go get it right. We can't keep acting like we've got to take advantage of the moment. Man, if you really love to worship, it affects your worship. It affects your worship. Have you ever come to church and on the way to church, either at the house or in the car, you got in a fight? And now you're all mad? And you're coming to church and you're mad. And you're all, oh my gosh, and I gotta be a greeter, I gotta be an usher. Oh my gosh, I don't feel like greeting, I don't feel like ushering. I, oh, oh my gosh, I'm the youth pastor. I've gotta deal with, oh my gosh, I'm the worship leader. I'm supposed to lead worship and I just had an argument. Eww, I'm the pastor and I've gotta preach and I just got in a fight. Man, guys, you know how hard that is? Some of you come to church and you're on the way to church and a fight breaks out and you're, we're going to go to church. I'm going to go to church no matter what. Hurry up. We're here to put on a happy face and let's go worship. Wow. Man, you don't feel like worshiping. You're like, oh my gosh. So deal with it and say, man. And then Pastor Emilio, put your hand on their shoulder or hold their hand. Don't touch my shoulder. Okay, touch my shoulder. And they're praying that the demons leave you, you know? Man, it, it, but you got to deal with stuff. You got to deal with stuff. Don't postpone it. Don't lay it off. Don't ignore it. Jesus didn't ignore stuff. He dealt with it. And he says, whether you're the offended or the offender, you're supposed to deal with it. So don't sit there, well, they offended me. No, no, the Bible says if they offend you, you're supposed to go deal with it. If you're the ones that offended, you're still supposed to go deal with it. You're supposed to deal with it. And then you need to say, say if you're going to take the initiative, take the initiative by setting up a face-to-face -face meeting. You're going to have a meeting. You're going to plan this out. We're going to meet. And choose the right time. Time means everything. Man, nobody ever fights at a normal time. I always say this, but I think it's true. You're all bugged during the day, and then you finally get home. We need to talk. Yeah, but we have to make dinner. The kids are hungry. You know, you're right. So you make dinner. 
Okay, we need to talk. Well, we need to clean up the kitchen. Yeah, you're right. So you clean up the kitchen. We need to talk. Well, we, we do, but we, we got to put the kid to take a bath and do homework, and we got to get the kids to, yeah, you're right. Okay, let's do that. Then we need to talk. Well, we got to put the kid to bed now. Oh, I got him. Okay, we need to talk. Well, golly, before we talk, our favorite TV program's on. Let's watch it first. Okay, you're right. You watch the program. Now it's 9 o'clock or 9.30, and you want to talk. And you're like, okay, let's talk. <laughs> you fall asleep. You're exhausted. And then it gets even worse. I can't believe you don't care now. You can't even stay awake. Well, I'm exhausted. See, we don't ever... Look, don't ever lay something heavy-duty at bedtime. Talk about it early. See, you know what? We know we need to have a fight. So we're going to have a fight. Mijo, while we have a fight, you eat here. We got you a happy meal. So at least somebody could be happy in the house. <laughs> Are you with me? But all kidding aside, maybe you could do that. Maybe you could get some carry out and you could feed the family. That we, you know, and you go, you know what? We really need to take care of this. And then do it in a godly way. Be open, be honest, but don't get crazy and start hurting each other with words and beating each other with, with attitudes. We've got to be loving. We've got to come with a positive attitude. Jesus tells us to do it. He says, take the initiative. Worship is worthless until you get right with God. So you reconcile. Second thing, that don't only just take the initiative, but we need to confess our part in the conflict. So confess your part in the conflict. In other words, you had part, they had part. Now, even if they have 95% of the blame, you still handled it wrong. So don't say, you know what, uh, I'm really sorry I acted like an idiot, but after all, you acted 95% worse than me. Don't say that. Just tell them, you know what, I don't know why we're fighting. I don't know what happened. I don't want to attack you. I don't want to blame you. I just want you to know I handled some things wrong. So take ownership for your 5% or 10%, whatever. And don't say, well, I was wrong and you were wrong, and I'm going to say I'm sorry. You better say you're sorry. They might not be ready to say you're sorry, but you take the high road. You do it first. Whether you're the offended or offender, you're supposed to do it. So take the initiative and say, you know what? I take responsibility. I really handled that wrong. I shouldn't have treated you like that. Now, if they don't automatically, and you sit there, aren't you going to say anything to me? They might not say anything to you. They might not be there yet. But the one closest to God takes the first step. Amen? Amen. Yeah, it's, it's not always easy. So you need to ask yourself, Lord, am I being unrealistic or am I being too insensitive or too oversensitive or am I being ungrateful? Am I, am I being too demanding? God, what am I doing? Show me what I'm doing so I won't mess up and do it wrong again. I need to do it right. Do you know what? It's a myth. Do you know what the number one excuse for divorce is in America today? The number one excuse, incompatibility. <clears throat> no one is compatible. You learn to love someone. Because you go, man, I really like this person. I, I love some of their traits. No one's perfect. You go, man, even in their imperfections, I could overlook them because they have greater strains and I'm going to choose to love them. Uh, now I don't love them. Now I've been living with them for a while and I've, I'm going to act like a little crybaby and I, I want a divorce because incompatibility. Let me tell you something. Two people can learn to love each other if they just grow up. I'm serious. That's hard to swallow, but it's the truth. Because what do we do? We fight. That's mine. That's my remote. That's mine. That, it's like, grow up already. Man, we act like little brats. We need to grow up and say, you know what? I'm self-centered. You're so centered. We're both so stubborn. We've got to be willing to change because right now we're not willing to change, and that's why we're fighting. More relationships need to learn how to be flexible. Learn how to be flexible, because we don't always get it right. But man, before honor is humility, so humble yourself and say, you know what, I'm really sorry. You want to end the fight real quick? Learn to say, you know what, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. You're right. Do you know how quick a fight will diffuse? So go, what? You're wrong. You admit you're wrong? Yeah, I handled some things wrong. I did. Because you did. You didn't handle everything wrong, but I handled some things wrong. Just get it over with. 
we've got to really make sure that we confess our part in the conflict. Next is listen for their hurt. Listen for how they're hurting. Listen to what they're saying. Because people are telling you what's eating at them and what's killing them. And you don't listen a lot of times and you don't even hear a word they say. And then they look at you and go, did you hear anything I said? And you're like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've said it before, hurt people hurt people. And when you're hurting, you need to find out what's going on, whether it be in your marriage, whether it be in the marketplace, in other words, at school, at work, or whatever the situation is, or wherever it is. When people feel fearful and they feel robbed of dignity, they get mad. And they feel violated and they feel, how dare them, man? They talk to me like that and they treat me like that. And oh my gosh. And, and then they get all uptight. And if you hear them out and you listen to what they're saying, you're going to start realizing that you hear their needs before your needs. Then they're going to go, wow, he actually means it. She means it. They want to hear me out. Um, the book of James chapter 1, verse 19, he says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. He's saying, in other words, you have two ears and one mouth. Use them. Use your ears twice as much as your mouth, otherwise you'll end up with a foot in your mouth. And you'll be like, oh, why did I say that? Why did I? Why? Because you weren't listening. The key to diffusing conflict is understand where that person's coming from, their circumstances, their background, their temperament. Just you hear them out and you get to diffuse it and you get to go, wow, this is amazing. We're working together. We're making it work now. Let me tell you something. Book of Romans, chapter 15, verse 1 and 2 says, we who are strong must be considerate. So he's saying, be considerate to those who are sensitive about these uh, things like these. We must not just please ourselves. Verse 2, he says, we should help others. Help others. Help out others to do what is right and build them up in the Lord. So he's saying, be considerate and help others. So don't just focus on what's about you. Focus on how can I help? How can I diffuse this? I want to listen to their hurt. I want to do what I can. I'm going to take an initiative. I'm going to take responsibility for my actions. I'm going to listen to their hurt. And then number four, I'm going to consider their perspective of the conflict. I'm really going to consider their perspective. I'm going to try to see things from their eyes instead of just my own. Because let me tell you something. A lot of times we just see it from our point of view and we can't understand why they can't see our point of view. And we say, oh my gosh, how selfish you are. How inconsiderate. And they they haven't seen it. They're not inconsiderate. They just don't understand where you're coming from or you're not understanding where they're coming from. And if you quit demanding your way to be understood and you start trying to listen to them and trying to get their point of view, you will find out, wow, I didn't see it like that. Oh my goodness, no wonder they got all hurt. They took it all wrong. They misunderstood. Man, in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, he says, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. He goes, you must have the same attitude Christ Jesus had. So he's saying, listen, give up your rights. We try to hold on to our rights. I have rights. No, you don't. As a Christian, you surrender your rights. God is your master and you're his slave. Whatever he says, you do. You don't fight over rights anymore. You surrender them. You go, I surrendered everything. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for how you're ministering to me. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done and everything you are. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, seek to understand before to be understood. So seek to understand. Pay attention. When you pay attention, you're showing that you want to be like the Lord because in Psalm 139, verse 3, it says, you see me when I travel and you see me when I rest at home. You know everything I do. God is aware. He's very much. He pays attention to what's going on in your life and you need to pay attention to what's going on in the life of people you love and that are doing life with. So you've got to be able to listen. And you've got to be able to understand and try to see their perspective. And then the fifth thing is you need to tell the truth, but tactfully. There's two ways of telling the truth. 
Some people go, well, the truth always hurts. Deal with it. No, the truth doesn't hurt. The truth heals. The truth helps. You are the one that hurt them. There's two ways of telling somebody, hey, man, I love you. I'm concerned about you. You've been putting on a lot of weight, and, man, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. Or, man, you're fat, all right? You're fat. Wow. You're both saying the same thing, but, man, one hurts a whole lot more than the other. See, you can be tactful in how you say it, because let me tell you something. When you wrap the truth up in love, it's received more than when you just wrap it up just with the truth and nothing but the truth because you end up hurting people you wound people and that's why you can't resolve conflict because because oh i told them the truth that's all i they have to deal with that oh geez how did you tell them man you didn't have to leave all these dead bodies tell them with love proverbs 12 verse 18 it, it says some people make cutting remarks but the words of the wise bring healing. Be one to bring healing. Foolish words hurt. Wise words heal. It's your choice. Which one are you going to use? You never get your point across by being cross. I don't know where I heard this. I stole it, but I liked it. It says you, you're never persuasive when abrasive. And that's so true. The meaner you are, the more they're going to resist. You've got to be able to say, I'm going to quit attacking. I'm not going to attack you anymore. I'm going to focus on the issue and not on the person. What's the issue at hand? Let's attack the issue and not each other. Let's establish some ground rules. When I do mediation with people, I say, these are the rules. We're not going to take cheap shots. We're not going to get ugly and vulgar. We're going to keep it clean, but I'm going to let you share. You've got to share your pain. Let them know, let them talk, and then now be quiet, let them talk, and we set some ground rules. You need to set ground rules when you talk. Don't get all ugly, don't get mean, don't get nasty. The book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Paul says, he says it this way. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything that you see be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. That's Ephesians 4.29. He's saying, this is how I want you to follow the rules. This is what I want you to do. I really want to make sure you tell the truth, but tactfully. And then the sixth thing is fix the problem, not the blame. Fix the problem, not the blame. We want to blame everyone. We're, have you noticed we're in the middle of a political year? Have you seen, aren't you sick and tired of the commercials? I know, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, shut up already. And all they do is blame each other. Tell me, look, I know the problems. You don't have to tell me what the problems are. We have a major crime issue in New Mexico. Do you all know that? Yeah. We have a major education issue. We're at the bottom of the list in education. You all know that? We've got some other problems. So tell me how you're going to fix them. Quit blaming each other and tell me what you're going to do so I can make an educated decision and who I'm going to vote for. But instead, they're there. But, and that's what, but we're no different. We're no different. Well, if you did this in the house and you did that and you did this to the kids and you did this to your father and you did this to your mother and you did that, 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 and all we are doing is blaming and not resolving it. What do we need to do to resolve this? Quit blaming each other. We obviously have a problem. I was part of it. I didn't cause the whole thing. I was part of it. You were part of it. But let's find out how do we resolve this? Do you remember the Cold War? That's what after the Vietnam War and everything, they had what was called the Cold War. They weren't fighting anymore, but they were fighting with nuclear weapons and on and on and on. And so they finally came up with the rules. They go, hey, look, we're not going to use weapons of mass destruction. We're not going to use weapons of mass destruction. That was the overall rule with the Geneva Code that they were not going to use weapons of mass destruction. I said, man, that's what we ought to do in our relationships. Quit using weapons of mass destruction because our mouth hurt people really, really bad. And we pull out the massive weapons of mass destruction and boom, 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 and we throw the past in them and we just take jabs at them and we cuss each other out and we use these tempers that are not godly whatsoever. And we act like idiots. And then we go, what's wrong with you? Can't you get over it? My gosh, you just ran over me with a truck. You haven't even taken me to the ambulance yet or the, the hospital. 
geez, let me start healing a little bit. Well, get over it already. Be a man. Be a woman. I was like, man, I, I thought I was, but after that, man, you destroyed me. You see, we can't fight like that. Stay within the boundaries. God's given us boundaries. Look what he says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Boundaries. But now is the time to get rid of all, get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. You know what anger and rage, an angry rage, that's when you want to intimidate people. You're going to intimidate them. You're going to threaten them. You know what? You know what? And you raise your boy. Man, that's, that's anger and rage. And that's how some people use it. Then you have malicious behavior. That's just saying cold-blooded stuff where you cut them, you wound them, and man, you stick the knife in and turn it nice and slow. And you sit there and go, ha, 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 I put you in your spot. And then slander and dirty language. That's insults, in other words. Where you're saying stuff that isn't even true. You're taking cheap shots. You're belittling them. You're attacking them. You're labeling them. You're blaming them. And blaming is a form of judging. And God says, quit judging. In the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 13, he says, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you'll, you will not cause another believer to stumble or fall. Man, he's saying, I want you to get it together. I want you to pull it together. I want you to understand that, that you've got to do everything you possibly can to fix the problem and not the blame game. And it brings me to the last thing I want to say is that we need to focus on reconciliation, not on resolution. And let me tell you the big difference. Reconciliation is to reestablish, to reestablish the relationship. The relationship's been severed, and you want to reestablish it. That's what reconciliation is. You're trying to make things right. You want back what you have lost. You want to be in a relationship with someone you love, someone that you're related to, someone that you work or go to school with, whatever, but you want to have that relationship again. That's reconciliation. Resolution is to resolve every issue. We've got to deal with this issue and that issue and this issue. And let me just tell you something. You could be reconciled with someone and not agree on all the issues. You could finally get along. You go, you know what? I'm going to agree to disagree. You obviously are different from me. I don't believe that, but I believe this. You believe that, but I don't believe that. And, and you go, you know what? But we can still love each other. You know what's really something that's it's really sad? Because it's an election year and our country is so divided and there's there's people that literally want to divide us even more. That now some families say, okay, we're going to have dinner, but two subjects we cannot talk about, politics or religion. It's like, why can't you? Because we'll get in a fight. Well, you only get in a fight because you're childish. Just because you disagree, that doesn't mean you can't love each other. Hey, so I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. Whatever you are, it doesn't matter. Don't have to hate on each other. And then don't say dumb things. Oh, you could be wrong if you want to. Don't say that. Just say, you know what? We obviously, obviously feel different about how to do life, but I still love you. You're still my sister. You're still my brother. You're still my husband or wife, my son or daughter, my brother, sister, my mom, dad and my mom. I can disagree, but I can still be in, in, in harmony with you. You don't have to have uniformity to have unity. You could be together walking hand in hand and not even be eye to eye with everything. It's like, man, I, obviously we don't agree on some things, but I'm still going to love you. I'm not going to throw out our friendship over this. Some people are like, ah, oh, don't ever talk to me again. I can't believe you like that kind of music. I can't believe you like those comedians. I can't believe you like those kind of politicians. I can't believe, I can't believe. It's like, goodness gracious. Now, if we disagree about Jesus Christ, that he is not the son of God, and he is not the only way to heaven, now we have some issues. 
But you know what? We've got to start agreeing. We need to start pulling this together. So my challenge for us today is to say, okay, God, we live in this conflicted world, a world filled with disagreements and wars and prejudices and clashing and violence and terrorism and tribalism and gangs and brokenness, broken relationships. God, in the midst of all of that, help us to become agents of reconciliation. Help us to be the people that are going to bring our family back together, our home back together, our neighborhood back together, our country back together, our workplace back together, our school back together. Today, if you disagree with somebody, people go and get a gun and they shoot up the workplace. It's happened in our own city. It's like, what's wrong with that picture? We've got to understand we have to be able to get along. We have to be peacemakers. Matthew, uh, Jesus wrote it in the book of Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 9. He says, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. We need to be peacemakers. We need to be the ones to take the initiative to bring healing in moments of conflict. But it's got to start with you being at peace with God. If you don't have peace with God, you have to start there. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity. He, the man, Christ Jesus. Only Jesus Christ can do that. So if you're not right with God, that's why you're in a constant turmoil. And you could be right with God, but the Bible says, how do you think you could be right with God if you're not right with one another? It says, you want to get right with me? Leave your offering, go get right, because if you're, not, if you're going to be right this way, you better be right that way. Because I taught you how to do it. So we need to bring healing. But if you don't have Jesus, that's one of the biggest problems. So if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to do that today, say, that's me. I, I really want to do that. Anyone on this side? Anybody want to give their life to Jesus if you never have? Just raise your hand. How about over here? Anybody? Anybody? Well, then I'm just trusting that everyone here has given their life to Jesus. So the question I want to ask then is, what relationship has God been putting in your mind as I've been preaching? You're going, man, ugh, I got to have a talk with my husband. I have to have a talk with my wife. She wasn't 100% wrong. And man, you want to end the fight real quick? Say, I'm sorry. Say, I was wrong. You were right. Or I handled it wrong. I'm sorry. I should have handled it different. Because you know what it does? It diffuses it. And now we can finally talk. So which relationship is God telling you that he wants you to step up on and to deal with? And I pray he give you a plan how to do it. Now, some of you, I understand you have, and I'm not being funny here, I'm being serious. You have a restraining order on somebody. Don't call them and say, I got to get it right. Don't write them because you will get in trouble and so will they. So write them a letter that you're never going to give them. And then read it out loud to God. Say, God, this is what I wish I could tell her. This is what I wish I could tell him. But since I can't communicate, and if I do, it's just going to make a mess. So God, I'm giving you the issue so you could deal with them. And then release it to the Lord. Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for each one of us. Because every single one of us, at one time or another, God has gotten into a conflict with somebody. And, Lord, the thing I want to make sure is that, Lord, we end the conflict, that we resolve the conflict, that, Lord, we could do it your way and no longer ours, so that, God, we could really see healing take place. So restore us completely, Father, from who we have been to who you want us to be. Lord, heal our wounds and help us heal the wounds of others that we have caused or others have caused, but Lord, we were part of the mix. Help us to get things right. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. Would you sing this song with us? Sing it as a, a song of prayer. Would you stand with us? And just say, you know what amazing love that welcomes me. Lord, we thank you. Amazing love that welcomes me. The kindness of mercy. The kindness of mercy. That bought with blood. That bought with blood. Wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. My soul undeserving. My soul.